Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your observations, your hot takes, your questions, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. I posted in the YouTube community tab over 24 hours ago, and I am overjoyed at the quality of some of these comments. So thank you, as always, for those of you who participate in the mailbag each and every week. We're back to the solo act, just me. Last couple weeks have been fun. We did a coach's mailbag with Jonathan Stokey. We did a guest mailbag with Abigail Johnson. Uh, both of them have a lot of evergreen topics, so if you missed those, uh, I think you can go back and still enjoy them even a week or two later. Uh, also, before I get started, apologies for the appearance of my eyes. I have been attacked by seasonal allergies. It is late February. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, if any doctors or scientists want to weigh in on why the seasonal allergies are attacking me in late February, you can go for it. But uh, yeah, my eyes do not feel great right now. They don't look great either. Um, I must also remind you that I have launched a new tennis newsletter before we begin. It is called The Draw. I curate the best tennis content on the internet each and every week. I was talking with my, my partner, Ben, and uh, he told me that only three people have unsubscribed to The Draw. Over 750 have subscribed. Only three have unsubscribed. It's pretty good. I feel like that means we're doing something right. And it's only going to get better from here. Go to The Draw dot tennis to subscribe that is the draw dot tennis and with that let's get into the first comment it comes from Wummer von Herzog here we go Francis Tiafo said tennis is the hardest sport in the world do you agree personally I think the distinction between hardest and toughest is important here Tennis is hard because of the mental and physical toll it takes combined with the rigors of touring and earning a living and the fact that it's mostly a solo sport. It's the hardest in my opinion, but obviously not the toughest if we're talking about physical toughness. Yeah, there are so many different variables to what is the hardest sport. I love debating this question though, and I, I do think it is important to note that toughest would be a, a hard argument for tennis when there are sports like, I don't know, MMA, where you take the odd shin to the neck. You ever taken a shin to the neck? I sure haven't. I have no interest. I'll stick to the tennis. Ever taken an elbow to the temple? Uh, yeah, these things don't look fun. And uh, certainly I think combat sports have a really good argument for the toughest. Just when you are in that arena and you're you're fighting someone, I don't think it gets tougher than that. Uh, but there are other variables in tennis that uh, I think do give it a pretty good case. The one-on-one -on -one aspect to it and the fact that I think it is probably mentally even in a lot of ways tougher than, let's say, a golf, I think mentally it is the, the, the hardest sport. I would point to... The, the technical difficulty of tennis as well. And I would say, think about beginners. Think about how much beginners struggle to play tennis. They suck. Beginners suck at tennis. And it's not as if people like pick up soccer or basketball or baseball and football. And it's not like they're awesome right away, but they can kind of do it where, and, and they can have fun with it. Tennis, it's so hard to start off that other sports have come in and taken advantage of how hard it is and have actually used that as a selling point and have taken market share away from tennis. Like that is what pickleball has done here. Pickleball is easier. So they've been like, yeah, you know how tennis is like way too hard? Well, you can play pickleball and have... A lot more fun, get into more rallies, uh, bring bring the family, bring the kids, bring the elders, bring the people who have bad backs and bad knees. Bring them all to pickleball. It's easier. You can do it. Like that's what this is. And I'm not even it's not even like throwing shade at pickleball. It's just it's just the reality of it all. So technically, tennis 
is a really, really hard sport. I would say um, in terms of the raw variables of athleticism, right? Take hand-eye coordination, speed, quickness, flexibility, strength, endurance, footwork. I would say that also tennis has a good well-roundedness. Like you kind of need a little bit of everything. And that's why I uh, I think it it's a very healthy sport to play athletically because I do think you're working all of those things kind of uh, in tandem. You're going forward, backward, to the right, to the left. You're working your lower body, your upper body. That said, if you were to put like a athlete, athleticism combine – like the NFL does for prospects, and you did like 40-yard dash, bench press, broad jump, uh, three-cone drill, like like all the you know the footwork stuff. I, I think there are top athletes in other sports that would outperform tennis players. So it's a very complex question. I think tennis has a, a really good argument. I also know that there are people out there who are uh, not as into tennis or maybe not as biased as myself, people watching the channel that uh, would actually laugh at the notion of tennis being the hardest sport in the world. Are they naive? Are we biased? I don't know. It's hard to say. All right, next one is from Micah. What's the likelihood Medvedev makes both the Indian Wells and Miami finals again? By the way, just a warning. There are a lot of Medvedev comments on, on this mailbag. Sometimes that happens where one player just gets a lot of comments, and this week it's Medvedev. Look, let's face it. Indian Wells is a terrible surface for him. It doesn't matter that he made the finals last year. It's a terrible... And remember, he was complaining about the surface throughout that entire run. And we've seen this before with Daniil. Obviously, he won Rome. But his chances still go down when it is a gritty, high-bouncing surface that is slower than the vast majority of clay courts. There's that, and then there's the fact that um, his serve is – something's going on with his serve in Dubai. It has not been all that encouraging. Like his ace numbers are really low. His speeds are really low. I don't know if a shoulder thing is is going on. No, obviously he hasn't lost. He's in the semis. He beat Sinego in a three-setter. He didn't hit an ace. Entire uh, three-set match, and he didn't hit an ace. And then he beat Alejandro Davidovich Vikina. And uh, he was only broken once. He won 6-2, 6-3. But uh, I'll tell you what, ADF should have started every point with like an underarm feed. That's how much his serve was neutralized. So it wasn't really the serve. It was more the return. So, look, I'm not, I'm not that confident in Medvedev winning Indian Wells, to be completely honest. Um, now this question said, can make the finals of both, uh, look, yeah, the likelihood is the likelihood is less than 50%. I don't know what you want me to say. Uh, next one is from Sean Killen. Hi Gil, with the recent rise of stars such as Mensik and Colin Skaya, I, I don't know if they're stars yet, but I'll continue with the comment. I'd like to ask about why Russia and the Czech Republic have so many tennis superstars is it due to it being the top sport to play while while they're young, or do they just have intensive training facilities? So I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, this is something that I think the Czech players increasingly are going to be asked about, and I'm I'm curious to. I haven't really seen a good, a really really good explanation of what Czech Republic is doing that is producing such talent. I know that usually. When this happens, there is some level of uh, studying that happens around the world. And this happened particularly in Spain. And uh, I know that the USTA did this with Jose Higueras, who was was leading the USTA development for some time uh, with Jay Berger. And when Spain was having a ton of success in, you know, from like 2005 to uh, 2015, Spain had what, like 15 players in the top 100 at all times, and the the U.S. was struggling a little bit. They looked to the coaching methodology and the philosophies in Spain, and they tried to take that to the U.S. Uh, at least to some extent. 
So usually there's a little bit of that. I haven't seen that yet with Czech Republic and Russia. Uh, it's also interesting that, you know, they even I think in both cases, Czech Republic and Russia, there's been more WTA success, mostly with Czech Republic. There's been more WTA success than ATP success. There is a club, though, in Czech Republic that has been unbelievably successful. And I was talking to uh, my friend Ido about this. Uh, it's called uh, Prostayov. Uh, I don't know if I'm nailing the pronunciation, but P-R-O-S-T-E-J-O-V. And it's produced Tomas Burdich, Pliskova, uh, Safarova, Lahechka, Mensik, just to name a few, which is an amazing, an, an, it's an amazing group. And I'll end on this. There is nothing more important in the development of a tennis player than having great competition to train with and to compete against. I think that's super, super important, and it's why you see uh, you see players, they move. Like, they uproot their families and move to a place where they can find competition that pushes them because it's, it's literally the most important thing in development. So if you're a Casper Ruud and you become the best player in Norway, it's time to get the heck out of Norway. Like, unfortunately, that's what you got to do because you have to find a place with other like-level players who are going to push you. And by the way, at a lower level, I'm doing a lot of that in Tucson. Right? I was introduced to uh, Steve Anacone, Paul Anacone's brother, and uh, he, he coached Paul on the tour. And uh, now he's had this fantastic career in in academies and and coaching. And he was like, "Look, I do this advanced competition program, and what I would like you to do is, yeah, help with the coaching, but also I want you to play with these kids and beat and beat up on them. And that's going to make them better. And that's what's so that's what's that's going to be really valuable for especially the the better kids in the program is they need somebody to push their level and to beat them a lot." So that's my job. But Steve is right. Steve is right. It, it makes them better. It's really, really important. So that's all I got. Look, I, I don't think that's the best answer. I don't think that's really a, a perfect answer. I'm sure there's more to it, why Russia and Czech Republic are producing so much talent. But I don't really know anything beyond that. Next one is from Glenn. Uh, he, he commented this eight minutes before I took the comment. So it got, it got no likes, but I did want to answer it. Uh, Andy Roddick spoke about the challenges of the pro tour schedule for top players in the context of possible new masters 1000 event coming to Saudi Arabia at some point. What are your thoughts on simply removing the mandatory participation for all events outside the slams? Let players choose and let the chips fall where they may. So first, let me answer your question. What are your thoughts on removing the mandatory participation for all events outside the slams? You can't do that. You can't do that because you're going to spook the sponsors. You're going you're gonna to drive down the value of the media rights because in these contracts, the reason why the sponsors feel comfortable entering these contracts and the TV partners feel comfortable entering the, these contracts at the price point that they do is because they know they're not going to get screwed over because these clauses are in there that, okay, these are mandatory events. We know all the top players are playing, and that is why we are willing to play, uh, pay a premium price for the media rights or the sponsorships. So the mandatory tag, I think, is very, very important in the financials of these events. I think I... I think this was a couple weeks back on Roddick's podcast, and I do believe I listened to this, where uh, Andy was saying basically that already the offseason is crazy short, so now how are we going to have players have a mandatory event in January to start the year in Saudi Arabia after this, like, you know, one month, in, in the cases of some players who might play Davis Cup, three-week offseason, and that's crazy and it's insane. I um I actually I I get what Andy's saying at the same time how different is it 
from what it is right now. Because if you look at the participation at ATP Cup, for example, it's really, really good. So most players are choosing to play first week of January anyways. Now, I understand there's a little bit of travel involved inevitably when it, as it pertains to hypothetically going from Saudi Arabia to Australia to play the Australian Open. But when it comes to off-season length, which is kind of what Andy was talking about, I don't know if it changes off-season length much. Now, there are a handful, very, very, very small number of players who did choose to forego the Australian Open lead-up events. Yannick Sinner, Carlos Alcaraz, Daniil Medvedev for the first time. Medvedev has always played before Australia. This time he decided not to. I don't know if any women did. I know I know Iga played United Cup. And, and this is kind of my point, right? Like, world number one on both sides played United Cup. And I can count, I think, three or four players, three or four top players decided, you know what? I need a longer offseason, so I'm not going to play the events before the Australian Open. Which is, I mean, that's not a lot. So, look, I I think the current state of the calendar, offseason's way too short. This, this is obvious. I'm not breaking any new ground here. I don't know who would disagree. Off-season's way too short. A Masters 1000, first week of January in Saudi Arabia, certainly wouldn't help. But I also don't think it would be much different from what we currently have right now. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Right now, I think the big battle, the big tug of war is Craig Tiley and Tennis Australia trying to avoid that from happening. Um, and look, I, I don't know how it's going to play out, to be honest. Our right, next one is from member Enigma Paradox. What do you make of Medvedev's career thus far? He has done exceedingly well, or has he underperformed? When measuring slam success, he's one in five in finals, but shouldn't we celebrate that he made six slam finals at age 27? He's won six Masters and lost three finals. He's won 20 titles and lost 17 finals. He's basically lost to Djokovic, Nadal, and Sinner in slam finals. Is there anything holding back Medvedev from reaching his full potential, or has he already peaked? Thanks, Gil. Oh, I mean, he's not even a hint of disappointment for, for Medvedev in his career. I don't know what his goals were or have been, but I, I imagine he's essentially reach them. And if you just want to look at the generation, right? I mean, compare the best players in his generation. He's, uh, look, these careers aren't over, but he's in a better spot than all of them. And I would vote him into the Hall of Fame tomorrow. And I can't say the same about Tsitsipas or Zverev uh, or Rublev or Dimonor. Uh, I don't know who else we're comparing him to. There's certainly a tier of player which is like the all-time greats, the generational players, where we kind of count their success in majors. But then I think there's one tier below that where you have you know great players, but maybe not generationally great players. And it's tough with the language here. I haven't really thought out these terms uh, as much as maybe I should have. But I think there's a level below that where you start to not count their success, their successes so much in majors, but it's have you won one? Have you been number one in the world? And then it's like how many year-end top fives have you had? How many career titles have you had? You start to kind of look at that stuff. And I just feel like Medvedev in that not in that top tier where you're counting success in majors, but in that tier below where it's like, you know, he's checked off most of the boxes and he's just been a top five player year after year after year. Um, and, and, and he's won that major and he makes major, he's made a lot of major finals, which I, I think is another thing that you start to count. If you're in that class of players where you're not tallying up majors, but you're looking at sort of other metrics, I feel like Major semifinals come into play. Major finals come into play. Um, Daniil, Daniil's resume, I feel like, has has um, elevated itself above basically all the other players in his generation at, as we stand right now. 
And then as far as like your last question is, has Medvedev peaked? Has he reached his full potential? You know my take on this. I mean, I, I've thought numerous times in the last, you know, five or so years since summer of 2019 that Medvedev uh, was had kind of reached his full potential um, in, in a lot of ways, but he has done some things that have made me rethink that. Uh, last year, there was some some baseline power that I think emerged mostly from him changing his string technology that I think enabled him to hit through heavier conditions more easily. And that is why we saw the the run at Indian Wells that we saw to the final. We saw the uh, Rome title that we saw. I think it was enabled by the fact that he was getting a little bit more uh, easy power from the back of the court. And then just this year at the Australian Open, we saw that he has put in the work to work on the return position, to be able to take the ball earlier and maybe even come forward when he needs to, when the when the tactics kind of call for it. So we'll continue to see how it develops from here. But I think Medvedev has been has found first of all a, a play style that suits his strengths. He's very committed to that style. He clearly has has the fitness and the physicality and the professionalism to be able to maintain that play style, which is not an easy thing to do. And uh, I also feel like his his whole legacy gets almost bonus points, a little bit of a boost because he has been such a uh, unique stylistic player where I, I think he's affected the game and uh, he's been an enjoyable addition to the top of the tour just in the sense that he uh, he plays in a way that is genuinely different. All right, and the next one is from YSA, uh, your take on the Medi and Simone partnership. I told you a lot of Medvedev questions. I think this is the last one, though, and then we're going to get to some other stuff. Uh, Medvedev and Simone. Uh, my first thought was like, good for Gilles Cervara, right? Like that team is tiny, the Medvedev team. There's just not a lot of people involved. And Gilles Cervara has just, I, I imagine... He has put in a absolute truckload of hard work and long hours throughout Daniil Medvedev's career um, as his coach. And I hope that he gets a little bit of a rest, a little bit of a breather now that there is somebody else involved. Uh, that was kind of my first thought. Look, Daniil is somebody who thinks through the game very deeply um, and I think for him to, for him to bring on a uh, Gilles Simone, I think it's because he truly has a uh, great respect for Simone's tennis knowledge and his, his tactical acumen. Um, the way Daniil said that the, the partnership kind of first came together was, um, he, he didn't like playing Simone. He hated Gilles as as an opponent and I think they started talking through now that Gilles was retired they started talking through what Simone was doing to Daniil tactically and then they ended up the first thing they did was Daniil made a list of 16 players who he doesn't like to play against and then Simone I think I think his job was to respond with like tactics against all of these players so that Daniil might have some different ideas uh, as to what to do when he plays these guys. So it already sounds like they're completely geeking out and nerding out uh, over tactics. And I think that Medvedev is the kind of guy who who benefits from that. He wants something to focus on. He wants to be thinking through the matchup uh, where some players can fall victim to overthinking in a way that kind of detracts from their ability to execute on court. I think Medvedev's a thinker. So... Seems like it's going to be great. That's all I got to say on that. Next one is from Raphael. What do you think are the viable solutions to allow players sub 200 to earn a consistent living wage rather than falling by the wayside? I think a minimum wage or just a better redistribution of prize money might work. Very disheartening to see people 
uh, in literally the top 1,000 of their profession make less than minimum wage or even a loss sometimes. Well, here's the thing. Uh, first of all, there is a minimum wage now. There is. Uh, it is for, I think it's just for the top 250. Let me see. ATP baseline, baseline prize money. Um, I always kind of forget what this is in terms of the specifics. It is, yeah, it's for the top 250. Uh, top 100 guaranteed 300,000. Uh, 101 through 175 guaranteed 150,000. Uh, 176 through 250 uh, guaranteed 75,000. Uh, so again, I mean, look, it's not minimum wage. It's much more than that, but the problem is the the cost of touring is through the roof, absolutely through the roof. So you can make $250,000 as a professional tennis player, and I know it sounds crazy, but it just doesn't go very far. Remember, the whole year, you're paying airfare, you're paying hotel fare, you're paying for your teams, um, and, and all of the things that come with that. So... It's just super expensive. The question here is, what do you think are viable solutions to allow players sub 200 to earn a better wage? And by the way, I think 200 is kind of putting it kindly. I think really it's outside of major qualifications. So outside of 125, I think all of those players could use a little bit of help financially, if we're being honest. But I think... And I don't have like the answer to this, right? I don't have the master plan. But I think it starts with really, first of all, getting into the mindset of not how can we redistribute the money that exists, right? Not how do we how do we subsidize the lower ranked players? Because like that's easy, right? You could easily say the ATP can just shove more prize money into challengers, or even the the 250 events can make it so that the winner earns less and in the first round you're guaranteed more. But that's just moving money around. And there is a little bit of that that goes on. Part of that is healthy. And then how much of that is appropriate? Now we get into this big gray area and this big debate, which has been, you know, is going to be, you're never going to get everybody to agree on exactly what that looks like. So let's get into the mindset, first of all, of, of growing growing the game at that level, not just moving the money around. Because I, I just believe there's a cap on how much, how far moving the money around is going to really be able to go. Uh, the first thing is already happening. I want to kind of take this opportunity in answering this question to say that the production quality, the product, the television product of challengers there is an effort to make that better. Um, and if you have watched any of the big challengers so far this year, you may have noticed that, but you are going to notice it more and more, especially in the high-level challengers that have 175 points on offer. Um, the next one that you can look out for is the Phoenix Challenger, and I'll actually be commentating on that challenger. So they are trying to uh, introduce uh, better broadcast quality as far as resolution and frame rate, more cameras, more commentators, and you know who who knows what what else and how far they can take that. But I think that's a really important example of something that can be done that is going to get more people watching, right? Like it's it's a really tough sell to get somebody to watch any sports product when the production quality isn't at the level that we expect and isn't at the level that we're used to. So I'm rambling a, a little bit here, but the main point I'm trying to make is let's get into the how do we make the product better headspace. And there's much more other than the broadcast. I just thought as somebody who's about to be involved in this effort to make Challenger Tennis a, bet, a better product... Um, I, I did want to um, talk about that, but there's the marketing side, the social media side, and other things that I'm probably not even thinking about. The other thing I'll say 
is and I don't know what this looks like, so I'm going to keep it really vague and really simple. But we know that there are a bunch of people around the world betting on tennis. And it is the players who are providing that product. And obviously the tournaments and obviously the tours. And I feel like it hasn't quite been figured out yet how players maybe even how the tours, how the tournaments, how can tennis get their cut of the betting industry, which is a massive industry? I, I'm not sure that's been figured out, and I don't – look, that's a very complicated thing that I don't pretend to understand, but I also want to throw that out there. Let's go to the next comment. All right, from Bard Land. We've just had two sparsely attended WTA 1000 tournaments in back-to-back -back weeks. Further future moves to non-democratic countries with poor attendance records under the guise of growing the game seem highly likely. Is there a risk to the WTA of simply chasing money at the expense of the global brand and ultimately leaving themselves at the whim of various dubious dictatorships, which could turn off the tap at any moment? Do they have any alternative? This is a really good question, but let's actually throw aside the more political aspects of it, right? We don't need to talk... Three mailbags ago, I covered some of this stuff, right, When in regards to Saudi Arabia. But forget the non-democratic aspect or the dictatorship aspect that, that you put in this comment. What you're really asking is, is there a risk here or is might it be a bad thing that there is not a natural economy – around tennis's popularity in some of the countries that the tours are increasingly going to do more and more business in. Another thing that I want to kind of check on the on the comment is you said WTA, but this is absolutely a thing for the ATP as well. Like think about it, they they moved the next gen finals from Torino, uh, not Torino, from uh Milan, Italy, probably the most like tennis crazed country in the world right now to Jeddah, where the crowds have not been awesome and the venue is really, really super tiny, right? So it's the WTA and the ATP. You bring up a concern that I think is a really valid concern about the product. I always say the atmosphere really makes the product. It really does. Uh, and tennis can be enjoyable to some extent, with no environment and barely any crowd, but there's certainly a limit on it. And like, I can tell you this, when I'm calling a match, especially, or even when I'm at a live event and I'm deciding what match I want to spend my time to watch, the crowd and the atmosphere, it, it, it's huge. It's absolutely enormous, in my opinion, for the enjoyment of a match. So when you're looking at a premium product, which is what a 1000 is supposed to be, and you are following the money in, and as a result of following the money, going into places where tennis is frankly just not quite as popular, you actually, you actually are hurting the product. And you mention in this comment as well that the, that they could quote, turn off the tap at any moment. That's the other aspect to this, right? Because if there's not an organic and genuine interest in tennis in these places where the, the 1000s are being held, then what exactly is propping up these tournaments? It's just the investment. It's just the money that, let's say in the case of Saudi Arabia, that the PIF is throwing at the event, but it's not. It's not a genuine economy, right? Like, ideally, the tennis tournaments sustain themselves. The Rome Masters don't exist because the government of Italy wants it to. The Rome Masters exists because everybody makes a lot of money. They make money. In theory, 
And uh, the, the same goes for kind of China, right? China made a big investment. Uh, it has made a big investment in China, but their events haven't been well well attended. Uh, yeah, it. in theory, when an investor decides, well, maybe, maybe it's not making enough money, so I'm out, uh, there's a risk there. Now, I, I, I think it should also be said, Doha and Dubai have been really good partners of the ATP and the WTA tour for a number of years now. So uh, they deserve the benefit of the doubt in that respect. And also, uh, attendance has been uh, decent in some cases. And the players have really liked going to those events. They have had really good, I mean, just the fields that they've produced and they've also voted, Do Doha has been voted ATP 250 of the year multiple times. So uh, I, I think that these concerns that you raise in this comment are uh, are really, really interesting concerns and they are uh, they are worth giving some thought. Ultimately, it, it does kind of concern me that the product takes a hit if you don't have great environment. And uh, I don't like that aspect of it. But also, you understand why it has uh, it has come to be in that situation. Next one is from Geb Manini, I think. Hi, Gil. Thanks for all the great content. I'm going to skip this part, but I appreciate the kind words. Recently, we've seen older players like Stan Wawrinka and Andy Murray have serious mental blocks in their games. Andy's issues have obviously been pretty well documented, but people forget that Stan served for the set versus Diaz Acosta and for the match against Nico Jari, who ended up beating Alcaraz last week. I know these are just two players and... Other old players like Monfils and Manorino are still thriving on the courts, but it got me thinking, do you think that as you age, your mental resilience, ability to play in pressure moments, and concentration is changed for the better or the worse? Awesome comment. Uh, I, have, I have heard tons, so not just one or two times, I have heard tons of retired former pros talk about how the nerves have gotten worse for them as they've aged. It is a real thing. When you start to feel like you have less opportunities, it can really get to you. It can really hurt your nerve management when you start to when when everything starts to feel more important. When you are super super young, and you're kind of naive, I don't think you think about your tennis mortality whatsoever. And you may not value the opportunities that are in front of you enough to really even get nervous. I talked about this when like Runo won the paris Bercy final against Djokovic. There's no way he could comprehend the weight of the position he was in and how rare being in that position actually is. Because he was new on tour and he was just he just got there right away. A player like that, in, in a lot of ways, is less likely to get nervous. Now, depending on the personality, can some young players get overwhelmed by a moment like that? Like, holy crap, Djokovic, final, Masters 1000, and go into a shell? Yes, but it is important to recognize that in some ways, in some ways it is easier and uh, less nerve-wracking to be in that position uh, at that age. I think as soon as you start to think, wow, I don't know how many opportunities I'm going to get to do this, or boy, this this only comes around, I'm in a semifinal uh, or, or something like that, this opportunity only comes around you know, two or three times a year for me, and who knows how many more opportunities I have in my career left to win a title. One that you didn't put in here, remember Stan in Umag. And I don't think he played a terrible third set, but when he lost to Alexi Popperin and he was up a break in that third set, right? How, how long has it been since he's won a title? It's been a really long time. And what was he up? Up, up a break, 4-3 or something like that in that Umag final against Popperin. That might have been his last chance to win a title in his career. So ask yourself, ask yourself how that might have, may have affected his nerves because he's very well aware of that. Now, there's also a physical aspect to this that I think is pretty important. I think it's been especially key for Murray and Vavrinka because their match endurance has suffered in recent years. 
And uh, remember that if you are, let's say, serving for the match in the second set at 5-4 and you start to feel yourself getting tired or you start to feel your legs going, and maybe in that instance, your gas tank might be okay. You might be 90%. Your legs might be feeling all right. But just the thought that oh crap, like if I don't close this off right here, I'm in trouble for the third set. Just those kinds of thoughts where you're not trusting your ability to go the distance or you feel like it's more important that you're able to maintain the lead or close out the match because you don't trust your legs, that can also add to the tension. Like I remember uh, a match a couple years back, Nadal Tsitsipas, when he blew that two sets to love lead. And in the third set, Nadal had been injured before this, this season. So he hadn't had quite the lead up that allowed him to get to his fitness levels to really where they, they should have been. And I remember in the third set, Nadal had a chance to close out the match in three, and he totally kind of choked. And as I was watching, I was like, what the heck? Why did he get so nervous there? And then in the fourth set, in the fifth set, he was dead tired. He had no legs. So then in hindsight, I thought to myself, ah, that's why he was so nervous in the third set. Because he probably felt physically that he was fading and he knew he needed the third set or he was going to lose. So that kind of thing is uh, also a consideration. All right, we are going to do... Three more here. This one is from David. Why is no one talking about Musetti? In the last 14 tournaments he's played, U.S. Open and onwards, he's suffered eight first-round losses and five second-round losses. His best result in this period of time has been reaching the semifinal in the Chengdu Open and ATP 250, and he only had to beat Sekulic and Rinderknecht, ranked 90 and 265, respectively. I can't even remember his last good win. It feels like it's been almost a year now, maybe against Djokovic and Monte Carlo. What do you attribute these bad results to and what does need to change if he wants to become a future top 10? Well, first of all, I don't think you watched last week's mailbag with Abigail Johnson. We talked about Musetti. So why is nobody talking about Lorenzo Musetti? Guess what? This guy's talking about Lorenzo Musetti right here. Uh, yeah, there have been a lot of mailbag questions about him though over the last like six months. Like he is a player who commands enough interest where when he's doing poorly, people do ask about him, and rightly so because he's talented. Just to quickly summarize what we talked about with Abigail um, last week, I made the point that his first serve is on the bottom of the top 50, and his forehand, I don't know that it's on the bottom, but it's probably average to below average. So he doesn't get those cheap, easy serve plus one points. And as a result, he needs to win a lot of baseline rallies, and he doesn't hold at a super high rate. Um, so now you're looking at a one-handed backhand who needs to break a lot and win a lot of baseline rallies. Like, that's how he needs to win. But particularly on the quicker surfaces with the one-handed backhand and his difficulty taking the ball early, his difficulty on the return of serve um, at times— because he, he doesn't take the return early very well, and he doesn't attack the second serve very well. Uh, he, he's in he's like the anti Titipas, right? He's the anti Titipas because Stefanos is able to cover up for whatever one handed backhand issues he may have because his first serve and his first forehand is absolutely money, and then he holds at a really really high rate. He doesn't need to break serve all that often to have success. Musetti, on the other hand, he needs to break serve a lot, or he's not going to win matches. And then Abigail pointed out, rightly so, that there's a surface thing where he needs time to produce this one-hander. And if you look at his clay court season last year, it was a phenomenal clay court season. He just hasn't had any results outside of that. So those are the two things we talked about. The surface factor, where he needs a lot of time, and the one-handed backhand combined with not having a good serve and forehand. Now, I think there are other factors. Uh, he does have a kid. He is a father. He has talked about his priorities and how maybe the tennis has not been at the forefront of his priorities in life um, 
and maybe that is affecting his performance. That is a little bit speculative on my part, but I want to throw it out there. I don't know. You know, there's confidence stuff. Look, I can say this. I've watched a lot of Musetti matches recently. I don't even want to say recently, last six months, where he's been exceptionally unclutch. So the nerve management thing, you can talk about technical limitations all you want, but if you're not going to be clutch and you're not going to manage nerves well, that's going to limit you in a really big way. Next one is from member Roberto KB. Hi, Gil. Circling back on the Saudi topic, Anz Jabur has spoken out in favor of larger Saudi involvement in women's tennis in particular as a way to boost women's participation in sports in Arab countries. I do think it's necessary for voices such as hers to be heard because conversations on women's rights have to intersect with fair representation for cultural slash ethnic minorities. We know for a fact that Saudi operations in, a, in sports are part of a state-led effort to polish the country's image and certainly not a bottom-up push for sports to be a driver of inclusion uh, in the country. I would very much like to hear An's thoughts on this with an open mind and see whether she disagrees with this assessment or she simply thinks that if the end result is more opportunities for Arab women in sport, it doesn't matter that the intentions leading to this result are not so, quote, innocent. Well, first of all, I agree with you. It's important to hear somebody like An Jabur on this issue. She takes on the role, and it is a really daunting role that she takes on to be almost the representative of tennis and the Arab world. And she needs to be that. She's the face of that. It's an unbelievable weight on her shoulders. And I have great admiration for how she handles that weight. Uh, and yeah. It's important that there's a diversity of voices. Uh, I also agree that she hasn't really been asked the difficult questions on this, unless I'm mistaken. And it would be very illuminating to hear what she would say to, again, if she put herself in a situation where someone was going to ask the hard questions instead of the, hey, Ans, like, what do you think of the rumored potential partnership between the WTA and Saudi Arabia. And I don't think it's gone further than that. I don't think she's had to deal with difficult follow-ups, which would allow her to kind of expand on, again, the more uncomfortable aspects or the, the, the harder questions. Now, I think the part of this that the PIF and the tours would disagree with you is in your comment, you say that this is just about the, the brand of Saudi Arabia. And it's just about polishing the country's image. And that it's not about participation and growing the sport within the country. Now, they would argue with that. They absolutely would push back against that. And I want to read the last paragraph in the release from this morning. The ATP and the PIF announced a multi-year strategic partnership to accelerate the growth of, glo of global tennis. That was the headliner. And really what it is, it is just a sponsorship. The PIF is now going to sponsor the ATP rankings, and they're going to be an active and visible sponsor at some of the largest ATP tournaments uh, throughout the year. John Wertheim reported the money value for this partnership. Wertheim said, I'm told the Saudi deal is worth $100 million over five years. It's just a, it's just a, a sponsorship. That's all it is. So $100 million is, to be frank, not that much money, but the value of what this is is not the same as uh, what the value to like host a tournament or be a, you know, naming sponsor of the entire tour or something like that. Uh, anyway, I want to read the last paragraph. The last paragraph says, quote, tennis is rapidly becoming a key sport in Saudi Arabia between 2019 and 2023. The number of registered players increased by 46%. PIF will leverage ATP's expertise to develop further opportunities for young Saudis in tennis, including via state-of-the-art facilities, coaching, and enhanced player pathway in Saudi Arabia. 
So at least publicly, and they say the percent rise, but they don't say what those participation numbers actually look like. They could be putrid for all we know. But you see a 46% rise from 2019 to 2020, uh, from to 2023. And the key takeaway is not being looking at the number and being hard on the, the actual number. The key takeaway is that they actually care about that, that they're actually, they care about it enough to at least put it in the press release. Last paragraph, but still. It's an aspect. It's going to be part of what they say matters in this. Next one from anonymous tennis follower reposted from last mailbag. Hi, Gil. With Osaka and Radu Kanu trying to make their comebacks, I've been hearing a lot of people say they should be playing 250s and smaller events to build up their match fitness and ranking instead of accepting wild cards into bigger tournaments and losing first or second round. Although Osaka did just make a 1,000 quarter final. What is your take on this issue? Would love to hear an objective take from someone knowledgeable since I feel people have pretty strong biases when it comes to these players. Yeah, I would agree. There are some pretty strong biases. I think it's different for both players, actually. For for Naomi Osaka, I mean, I don't think I don't think she needs to dip down to the lower levels. Uh for Osaka, who's accomplished so much, I I, I think she is going to hit a level that she wants to um pretty quickly, honestly. And I think playing top competition will help her. For Radu Kano, it's interesting because there is like a tennis argument to be made that she should just dip down and kind of do the natural, the natural progression that she never really got to do in her career, right? She didn't do the thing. Like she skipped 20 steps. It was what, her like fourth? And I don't actually I, I don't actually know the number, but it was something like her fourth ever WTA main draw, and she won the U.S. Open. So then she was a top 20 player, and she didn't do much winning on tour from that point on. She, she just didn't. So this kind of is her opportunity to do the whole thing over again and maybe do the normal path of building up your ranking by playing ITFs, Winning, 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 winning. And by the way, she's she's a really, really good, talented player. If she plays ITFs, she will win them. She will rise up the rankings organically if she does that. And then she can just kind of build confidence, start to play the, the, the tour events after that. And uh, it would give herself an opportunity to kind of do that traditional path. So for her, I think there's an argument that, well, maybe she should. For Osaka, maybe not so much. What I won't hear, though, what I won't hear is that a player who is being offered wild cards has some sort of moral obligation to not take them. That is the one thing that I I never have any tolerance for that state for that take. Because um, the reality of that is nobody deserves necessarily a wild card. Like that is not why wild cards exist. If the tours were interested in only allowing people into the tournament who fully deserve it, then there would be no wild cards. There would be zero such thing as a wild card. The reason wild cards are in place is to give tournaments an opportunity to bring players into the draws that are going to uh, boost interest in the event. That's why wild cards exist. So don't turn around and say that the players who perfectly fit that function of what a wild card is supposed to do, don't turn around and say that those wild that those players should not take the wild cards because somebody else deserves them more. I'm getting fired up about an hour into this thing because it's nonsense when I see that online. Nonsense. One more since we so that we won't end on such a sour note. It comes from Lorenzo. Hopefully not Musetti. Uh, if you had to pick the player with the most chance of winning the Sunshine Double, who would it be? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go center, right? Uh, Miami is a tournament where he his resume in Miami, center, he made the final, then he got injured and had to retire from a quarterfinal, and then he made the final. So every year he's played Miami, he's done incredibly well there. 
The surface at Indian Wells, I actually think should suit him decently well. Uh, and right now he's playing the best tennis in the world. So Yannick Center is my answer to that. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I will see you next time.